on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. South Carolina head coach Shane Beamer joins us for an interview. We talked to Shane about his first year as a head coach, life in the SEC, his strategy when it comes to NIL and the transfer portal. And of course, we touch on all of the changes that have happened at OU. That's it. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hostie, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, March 14th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and your health and safety are Riverwind's number one priorities. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And Fridays in March from 6 p.m. to midnight, you can win your share of $80,000 in cash and bonus play in Riverwind's $80,000 courtside cash giveaway. Drawings are every 30 minutes, and grand prize winners will be selected at 1159. If you need help finding your way, just visit riverwind.com, Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now we're recording this episode way in advance. <laughs> I, I am going on a much needed long vacation. Ted, so get it in. we, we got to get it, got to get away just a little bit, but we can't, we can't leave the listeners out to dry. We can't just go two weeks without, without putting an episode out. So this is, this is when technology uh, works for us and we, we bank a couple interviews and then we use them as the episodes. Boom. Perfect. And it's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm excited about this and a lot of fun. Shane Beamer. Shane Beamer, ladies and gentlemen. So just a reminder, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment while you're at it. Also, we may have sponsorship slots opening up here in the near future. So if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, email the Oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com and we will get you all of those details. But a programming note, we've got Shane Beamer on this episode. We will be taking Wednesday night slash Thursday morning off. There will be no show the rest of this week. But don't you worry, people. We're making up for it. I promise. Because Sunday night slash Monday morning, yeah, bad turnip seed. Bad turnip seed. Try and peel away some layers and see what's going on there. Yeah. It's so, going to be awesome. So we, uh, we've got a beamer. Beamer interview and then followed up next week by turnip seeds. So hope you guys enjoy this interview with Shane Beamer. Let's get right to it. Here's Shane Beamer. It is our pleasure to be joined by the head football coach at the university of South Carolina, the real USC. Some would say <laughs> he is Shane Beamer. Our guy. What's up, man? Not much. It is great to be on with you guys and always look forward to this. Hope y'all are doing well. Man, it was a it was a crazy year for you guys last year. Um, tough schedule, but you guys kept rocking. Had some really big games, some some really fun games. It looked like the fan base really got behind you guys. That was an exciting first year. Yeah, it was. It was a uh, great young men that we were coaching up and down. You know, it was uh, we got to be more consistent going forward. But you know, proud of the way we finished. Won three of five. Won our bowl game. Beat Auburn and Florida down the stretch. Um, you know, and and. It was a resilient group, Teddy. I, uh, you know, we lost uh, Georgia and Kentucky back to back in September, but after that, we never lost more than you know. We never lost two in a row. It was win, loss, win, loss. Now we got to be more consistent and put uh, better, better football on the field. But it was a resilient group that always came back from um, from defeat. So, w when it comes to right, it was it was your first year being the head coach. What, what was, what was the most challenging part, right? Cause this is, this is something as much coaching as you've done as many great head coaches as you've been around. Like what was, 
What was the most challenging part for you being the head guy and kind of leading the entire program? I think just you realize that, and, and you've, I've heard it before, you guys have heard it before, when you're an assistant coach, you know, you give suggestions and things like that. But when you're the head coach, literally every decision that's made for the South Carolina football program from top to bottom ultimately is, you know, my decision. So understanding that, and then more specifically with the season, I think it was just realizing that, you know, when, when I walk in the building every single day, all eyes are on me and that pretty much everyone in that building is going to essentially go as I go in that leadership position. And, you know, being able to, you know, we went out to College Station, Texas, played awful against Texas A&M, got beat, you know, pretty convincingly fly back, you get back at three, four o'clock in the morning, but then you've got to walk into a team meeting the next day, you know, and, and learn from what happened in college station the night before, and then get ready to go for the next week. And just, you know, the challenge of doing that every single Sunday, learning from what happened the day before setting the, the, the tone for the upcoming week. And then just that consistency week in, week out. I mean, it was a challenge, but I love that part of it. But that was that was probably the biggest challenge for me as a, as a head coach, you know, beyond the X's and O's and things like that. How do you find that balance? It seems so hard and because you got to keep the message consistent, but be able to say that's not good enough. That's not who we are. But then at the same time, be like positive and upbeat about the future. It seems like a tough balance. Yeah, it is. You know, I just tried to be real and and just honest and and there was a thin line because you know frankly when i took over last year this program was coming off back-to-back -back losing seasons had won two two games the week before and sorry my dog's going crazy and had gone uh had won two games the year before uh so confidence was somewhat of an issue and sorry confidence was somewhat of an issue <laughs> and then being able to Oh, my dog, my wife was handling the dog. I guess not. Confidence was somewhat of an issue. So balancing that line between, okay, not crushing them and, and hurting that confidence, but also being very honest about uh, um, this isn't good enough. But I think for us, we talk each week about how we're going to win football games. And it was, it was easy from that standpoint to be able to walk into those team meetings after games and say, okay, guys, we know these are the five things we want to do each and every week to win games. We didn't get it done, and here's why. And uh, here's how we have to do it this week and things like that. So uh, last time we had you on, uh, we, we talked about kind of your vision for South Carolina football, kind of what you thought the culture should be and could be there with you leading the program. H how do you feel about where the program's at? Now, right, obviously not satisfied with only winning seven games, even though everyone views it as pretty dang good first season for you. But how do you feel about where the program's at compared to kind of the vision you have for it? Yeah, I think we're getting there. Um, we made some great strides in year one, being able to uh, win a bowl game and have play like we did down the stretch. Um and with some of the additions that we've brought into the program, whether it be high school recruiting, transfers, uh, we've certainly elevated the, the, the status, I think, of how people view South Carolina football. Now the challenge is going to be to take that to the next level. You know, last year, our players were getting told how bad they are and, and, and uh, we weren't going to be able to go to a bowl game. Three or four wins was the ceiling for this team. And now our players are getting patted on the back and congratulated on the great season they just had and, and, uh, and balancing that as well. You know, people say, well, you guys have done great things. You're going to be ranked, you know, close to the top 25 preseason. And I'm like, yeah, and I think seven of our opponents are going to be ahead of us in the top 25 as well. <laughs> so let's be real here. We've got a lot of work to do. We certainly made some strides and, and, and I like where we are just, not just on the field, but off the field, the way our guys are doing things and the way that we've grown. And now the key is going to be understanding how much work went into winning seven games last season and going from two wins to seven wins. But now it's going to take that much more work to go from seven to eight, nine, 10, you know, and beyond. How's the, 
the ever-changing landscape of college football been to navigate as a head coach, like the NIL stuff, which, I, you know, you probably had a good idea that it was coming down the lane, but that kind of comes full steam right whenever you take over. Is, is that just been another addition to throw, thrown on your plate, or has it been something that you guys have been able to embrace and use to an advantage? How, how's that gone? Yeah, it's um, I think it's something that we're all learning each and every day about, and it's funny, Teddy, like I tell people, the month of, uh, was it June of last year was the first time that high school recruits, prospects could come onto your campus after COVID, the dead period and all that. So every single day in June, we had multiple prospects on our campus. And I think the entire month of June, name, image, and likeness was brought up by a prospect to me twice in the entire month. And I had, you know, countless number of prospects on our campus and in my office. And then you fast forward to December and literally every single meeting or every single conversation I have with a prospect, it's around name, image, and likeness. So it's something that we're all, you know, it, it came full speed, full throttle. I think we're all navigating through it, but uh, it's, it's here. And whether you like it or not, you better learn to embrace it and, and maximize your individual school's ability to, to, uh, to help your student athletes from that standpoint. And, and I feel like we're, as well situated as, as any program in the country before that, you know, we're, we're, we're in the SEC. Uh, we don't compete with pro sports here in South Carolina. We have no major league baseball or NFL franchise, you know, the Carolina Panthers are an hour and a half away and, and uh, the, the Braves and, and, and the Hawks are three hours away in Atlanta. So we don't compete with other pro sports uh, Clemson's two hours away, but in more of a, you know, a, a rural environment. And if you will, we're sitting here in the capital city of South Carolina and there's tons of Gamecocks, not just here in Columbia, but, are, but all over the state and region. So we're in a, and, and we're at a fan base that, that loves their athletics. You see that with our women's basketball program, who's number one in the country and, and baseball has won back-to-back -back national championships in the last 10 or so years, 11 years. So we're as, we're well situated and now we just got to continue to navigate the landscape and, and, uh, and, and, and stay ahead of everything. We'll get you right back to the interview, but first the only place to stop when you're road tripping is loves travel stops. Loves has over 560 locations in 41 States offering 24 hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are loves has it fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including yes, my favorite, java amore that coffee is fantastic loves also as you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones they've expanded their mobile to go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there make sure you download the loves connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands the loves connect app also includes a route planner and store locator when you see that red neon heart on the highway stop in and say hi at loves travel stops for a full list of what loves has to offer visit loves.com Opolis Clothing is the home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. Make sure you go buy our Buttery Soft It Ain't Good Enough shirt or the Texas Sucks shirt. Go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use our promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off of your entire order. You still get a discount on all of the OU and Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma City Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use the promo code to, uh, TED for 10% off, buttery soft, and 10% off. All right, back to the interview. So you, you mentioned that it, it comes up constantly now in, in recruiting. How do you react? Like, because I know it's, it's, it's very new, but how do you react when that's like the first thing a recruit brings up? You know what I mean? Because it, it seems like, you, you want to focus on the football piece of things, but it, is, it, is it just an adjustment period for you to yeah. hear like the, the recruit and their parents bring that up first? Because that, I don't know, back in the day, that would have been a big red flag. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's an adjustment because I consider myself somewhat like old school in a lot of ways. And it is an adjustment when, all right, so Spencer Rattler is here. Spencer Rattler just um, did an endorsement deal with a local car dealership here, and they provided him with a truck. And 
immediately I've got a sophomore in high school texting me about, hey, if I come to South Carolina, do you think I'll be able to get that same deal and things like that with the same dealership, you know, and, and one, I can't facilitate anything, you know, uh, because of the law, but realizing that that's the mindset and, and that's what a lot of these guys are, are thinking right now. And, and we don't want to be over the top and, and, in selling name, image, and likeness, but we're also very cognizant of it's out there and, and other schools are, and we've certainly got to put our best foot forward from that step, from that standpoint as well. But I do think you got to do a great job, Gabe, of just of at the end of the day, making sure you're recruiting guys that love football and love to compete. Uh, and I think it's even more important now than ever, because, you know, if you don't, if, 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 we're all for the name, image, and likeness and guys being able to capitalize on it. I think it's great. You know, the young men on our team that have been able to, they've done a lot of things to be able to give back to their local communities and, and put on camps and things like that. And I think that's awesome. Um, but also if, you know, you don't love football, you guys have played at the highest level. If you don't love football and you don't love to compete, you're going to have a hard time making it in, in this program or, or any program. Uh, and, and we just got to do a good job of evaluating during the recruiting process to make sure that those are the type of guys that we're bringing into the program, you know, and then if you do that, you're going to be able to capitalize on all kinds of opportunities uh, from a name, image, and likeness standpoint. Can you take us through how the, the Spencer Rattler transfer situation went down? Uh, obviously, he had a – everyone around here had a wild year last year, and, and he was front and center in that. Um, when did that possibility – pop up how did you guys navigate that just that that whole situation was was pretty wild it was um it was really crazy um you know I really think it it started with um uh with Austin Stogner so when Stog went in the portal uh literally his dad reached out to me immediately that that Austin was in the transfer portal and and Austin and I had a great relationship when I was at Oklahoma and it, myself and his family as well, particularly with everything he went through in 2020 and all that. Um, so got on the phone with Austin. He came out here for a visit immediately. I think he went to Iowa State and, and Ohio State also after he left us. But while he was here on the visit, he brought up, you know, if you had any communication with Spencer and and I said, no, not really. I sent, a, I sent, a, sent him a text or a direct message one uh, when he went in the portal, just telling him I was thinking of him and, and, uh, and best of luck and wishing him well and all that, but didn't want to like push too hard from our standpoint. And, and I, I'll be honest with you, like a lot of people just assume he was going to head maybe back to the West Coast or somewhere closer to home or something like that. Um, and, you know, at the time we were busy with recruiting and we had just finished up our own season and, uh, when, and Austin's dad said, you know, you really ought to reach out to him. I think he really is wide open in regards to where he's going to go. And uh, we just, we started talking. I actually, you know, flew out. I didn't know how serious Spencer was. You know, we were going to fly out to Arizona and sit down with him and his family. And he said, there's no need to. We did a, uh, like a virtual visit over Zoom with Spencer and his family so they could meet the people here in our program and, and see Columbia. This is after Austin had taken his visit. Um, he didn't want us to fly out to Arizona. He was actually in Norman before he went back to Arizona for Christmas. So I, myself and our offensive coordinator, we, 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 uh, we signed a young man out of South Lake Carroll in Dallas. So we were going out there to visit with him. So on the way out there, we stopped and actually flew into Norman and went over to Austin's apartment or house to sit down and visit with Austin uh, before uh, while he was in Norman and Spencer was actually leaving that day to go back to Arizona. So I was like, look, just hang on and leave after we get there and we're after we visit with you. And he left before we got there. So I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way this guy's coming to Oklahoma, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and then we were going to try and bring him out here. And he said, I really don't need to come out there. I, I saw everything that I needed to see on that virtual visit over Zoom. And I know what Stog has told me about South Carolina and, and about Columbia. And I'm good. And, um, you know, I felt decent about our chances, but not great. 
and then it was actually pretty cool, Teddy. It was a Monday night. I think Monday night football was on. And and initially, Spencer had told me he was going to make a decision closer to Christmas time. And then his dad or Spencer, I guess it was Spencer one, sent me a text like late afternoon, early evening on that Monday that, you know, he's going to make a decision here, he thinks, here in the next few days. And I said, okay. And then next thing I know, about two hours later, I get a phone call and it's, Austin, Austin's dad, Spencer and Spencer's dad, all on the phone. And they basically just told me at once that they wanted to come to South Carolina. And I said, well, when do you want to announce something? And they're like, immediately. And they announced it and that was that. So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And I think ultimately it started with just the relationship I had with both those guys when I was in Norman. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's tricky when, you're out of another school. You can't really keep in touch with guys at the school you just left from an NCAA standpoint. But I mean, all those guys I coached at Oklahoma, particularly the ones that I had at my position, Jeremiah Hall, Braden Willis, uh, Stog, you know, I still have great relationships with those guys and started with that and thankful that they have, um, they have trust in, in, in me and what we're doing that they wanted to come out here and play. Now you, you guys haven't gotten on the field yet for spring ball, but, how how have Stogner and Rattler kind of you know blended in to the program? Like how, how have they how have they just started the process of going from Oklahoma and South Carolina to South Carolina? Like I, I can't imagine that's easy, but it does seem, especially for Rattler, a bit of a a bit of a reset and a fresh start, right? Yeah. I think for both of them in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, Austin is not <clears throat> fully into the program yet because he still had uh, four classes he had to take at Oklahoma in order to graduate. And if he had come here, he was going to lose some of those credit hours. And I'm like, man, you're four hours from graduate from the University of Oklahoma. Just finish your degree and then get out here. So he's doing some online classes. Um finishing up his degree and he's able to be out here with as much as he can within the rules he is. So he's been around the guys uh, some and, and has gotten around some of our activities uh, and has done great. Spencer has been out here and has been full speed ahead since I guess the end of January. And he, he's been fantastic. You know, he, uh, it is a little bit of a unique situation because of how high profile he is and the fact that he's won you know, won a conference championship and, and everybody knows who Spencer Rattler is. And that's not an easy situation to come into when you just <clears throat> show up and and have to indoctrinate yourself into the team. But he's been awesome. He really has. He's uh, I think he's done a great job of of knowing when to, you know, assert himself as a leader, maybe not immediately or maybe not as vocally as he would like, but just the little things getting in the front of the line during workouts and, and conditioning sessions and, and trying to lead by example and then slowly being able to uh, be a little bit more vocal. And, and he's been awesome. And it's been good too, because the NCAA this year changed the rule uh, probably been when you guys were playing. And I know it has been since I've been coaching, but you're allowed to have, uh, walkthroughs before spring practice and before you couldn't use a ball in those walkthroughs but this year yeah so teams would just like wrap up a towel and that was the football but this year they started letting you actually use a ball so Spencer was able to get out there and and throw uh, in walkthroughs and things like that and be able to throw to the receivers and tight ends and be able to you know, break the huddle and take the snap and, and, and run plays, you know, on air or against our defense in a walkthrough. So that's been good because you see some of the, the arm talent. And I think that speaks for itself with the guys as well. So they've done awesome. We're on spring break this week. So, you know, he's away. And then uh, we come back from spring break next week and then get, get right into spring practice, but he's done awesome and, and happy. He's up uh, happy. He's here. And he's such a, he's such a, you know, he really is grounded uh, and great family. We've got a great basketball recruit here in Columbia that everybody in the country's after. You know, that young man came on a recruiting visit a few weeks ago, and he wanted to meet Spencer Rattler on his recruiting visit, you know, and, and that's just the, the impact that Spencer has and, and, his, and, and, 
and kind of his uh, his reputation. And Spencer did a great job of meeting with that recruit as well and, and, and couldn't have been better. So I'm excited about him being here and, and uh, looking forward to working with him. We'll get you right back to the interview. But first, attention business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Yeah, you do. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A. Com. Guys, weather's getting warmer, but the weather doesn't matter because it's always hard seltzer season, baby. And there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast, and that is Sonic Hard Seltzer from Coop L Works. It's perfect for any occasion. We drink in the hot tub, by the fire, and at the tailgate. You can buy 12 packs of the iconic Sonic drive in flavors like cherry limeade and ocean water, or you can grab a citrus variety pack or a tropical variety pack. Find it at your local grocery, convenience, and liquor stores. All right, back to the interview. Uh, he made a comment that he's learned more over the first, you know, however long he's been there <laughs> since he, that he did the whole time at Oklahoma. Now, part of that may be a shot, but I took that as there's probably a whole different level of things asked from him. Maybe uh, reading defenses, setting protection, getting to alternate plays on his own. Just kind of like, uh, I guess I want to know like what the offense is going to be like. And are you guys just marching with what you've always done? Or are you going to build some things around that arm talent that you were talking about? Yeah, no, I think you always have, and you guys know this, you always have to, you want to have a system flexible enough where you can adjust to the strengths of your players year to year. And whatever we got, we've got some good pieces around the quarterback position with a couple transfer running backs we brought in. Austin Stogner coming in. We've got a really athletic, dynamic, you know, tight end returning as well. And, and uh, our leading receivers are all returning. Plus, we've added a transfer from James Madison that's a really good player. So we've, uh, we've got some good pieces around them. And I did see that comment. I'm like, man, uh, dang, Spencer, um, when, he, when he said that. But I do think what he's alluding to is um, we, we – what – what the offense at Oklahoma asked him to do was different than what the offense at South Carolina is asking him to do. And that's not right or wrong necessarily. I mean, it, at, at Oklahoma, Lincoln could, Lincoln could signal in a, a, a formation and a play and Spencer had to communicate that to every single receiver. Spencer had to know the protection that went with that play, communicate it to the offensive line and then handle that, you know, we're a little bit different in how we communicate stuff, you know, and I think the, the one thing that attracted, one of the things that attracted Spencer to us was just being able to learn, you know, you hear different styles of offense thrown around, pro style, air raid, spread, whatever it may be, but what we're doing is very much, uh, our offensive coordinator came from the Carolina Panthers, he and I had worked together uh, previously in the past when I was a graduate assistant at Tennessee. So it's it's that offense that they were running with the Panthers, which was a lot of the Joe Brady LSU terminology that Joe Brady brought from the New Orleans Saints, also combined with what Matt Rule was running at Baylor. So it's kind of a combination of those two offenses as far as how we call things. But then what we're asking, you know, the quarterbacks to do, it's, the terminology and, and the verbiage is a little bit more like a, a uh, an NFL type offense. And that's not right or wrong. It's just what we are. And we huddle primarily. We're a huddle team. We're not no huddle going 100 miles an hour. You, what, excuse me. What's, 
What's this can huddle? You explain thing? That yeah. Can it's you a, explain this yes, huddle thing? It's, you're a, it's 11 about? guys. They get in a circle around the ball and, and the quarterback actually communicates to the, to the people in the huddle. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we, we did that when I was at Oklahoma, you know, it was usually down there on the goal line or short yardage. We would get in a huddle. Uh, so it's not the first time, but it's been new, like spitting out, you know, play calls and getting in the huddle, but also being able to go no huddle and utilize tempo and things like that. We're asking him to do a lot, and I think that was a challenge for Spencer to be able to uh, um, take what he learned from Coach Riley at Oklahoma and then also add a new system on top of it that will help him when he goes, you know, hopefully to the next level to play uh, after his college days are over. So clearly you're, you're, you're focused on getting South Carolina football to where you want it to be, right, to being an SEC contender. But – I have noticed you're going to all kinds of different things when it comes to all kinds of different athletics events there in South Carolina. Like how important is it for you to build kind of that sense of community with, with all of the athletic programs there at the university? It's huge. Um, you know, one, I saw my dad, he did that. I thought he did a great job of that at Virginia tech and it wasn't an act. I mean, he was genuinely a fan of, of all sports and, and, you know, at most colleges, the football program is kind of the bell cow. It's the face that, you know, is, is uh, uh, along with the other sports. And, and I just love, I love the college environment of being in a college community. And Columbia is awesome because it's a, it's a bigger size city that's the capital, but it's a college town. I mean, everything's geared towards South Carolina athletics. And uh I love one just being able to go out and support the other teams, uh, but I'll but you know I, I love being able to go and just uh, watch and try and learn as a coach too. I mean I love going to basketball games or going to you know I was with our women's golf team. They had a tournament down in Hilton Head last week and went down there for a day and just being able to watch how you know they they coach their players you know one of my best friends when I was living in Norman was Ryan Hibble the golf coach there at Oklahoma and, and I learned a lot from Ryan still do just with how he handles his players on an individual basis and when I when I get done uh, doing this with you guys today I'm going over to watch our basketball team practice um, you know I just think you can learn from other coaches and and I love it's a it's I want to have a strong sense of community Columbia is and the more that I can be out and about and and uh, show appreciation and be around those other sports. It's great. And it's cool for my kids too. I mean, I was fortunate when we were at Oklahoma, you know, that I could take my, take my daughter who's big into dance and go watch the gymnastics team, the women's gymnastics team at OU practice or, and go to meet. I mean, that was awesome for, for my kids. And, and now as my, my two daughters and my son get older, uh, being able to take them to different sporting events and things like that to, to watch, you know, whether it be my, my oldest daughter loves volleyball, going to watch volleyball or, or dance or whatever it may be. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to be a part of. So there's a lot of reasons and, and um, you know, it's a cool community to be a part of. You know, I, I think it's, it's interesting because we, we had coach Venables on the podcast the other day and we're, we're talking to him about like the transition, like kind of like demeanor wise from, from being a coordinator and then to be a head coach, I, did, is there anything that you really had to change? I mean, you're, you've always kind of felt head coach ish, if, if you will. So it didn't seem like maybe it was that big of a transition, but for a guy like Venables, who's a defensive coordinator, been an in your face type of guy, like how's that, is that anything difficult to navigate or you just kind of take it as it comes? I think I just took it as it came. Um, um, you know, I think the background that I had on being around special teams always helped me because you were dealing with offense, defense, you know, you were dealing with all three phases in regards to that one. And then, um, and I wasn't like I was calling plays like Lincoln was or calling the defense like Coach Venables was. I wasn't in that role at Oklahoma. Uh, special teams wise I was calling stuff and organizing things but it wasn't as big a transition for me it was more just kind of like be myself and you know it, it it gave me a newfound appreciation for the head coaches that run their call the offense 
and coach the quarterbacks like Lincoln Riley did at Oklahoma, and I'm sure he will at Southern Cal, you know, just because of everything that comes across my plate each day as the head coach. You know, that would be, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that those guys are able to do that, uh, whether it be whoever, not just Lincoln, but other coaches that run the offense as well and, and call it. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was just be myself and, you know, the biggest thing was just like at practice. All right, where, where do I go? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> horn blows and all right, normally you're going to like with your tight ends or whoever, and now you don't have a position anymore. So it's like, well, what the heck do I do now? But I just try and be a lot like I was as an assistant coach, you know, involved with every position and have relationships with every position and each guy and being able to bounce around different places has been fun to do as a head coach. Do you, do you miss being a position coach at all? Obviously being the head man is the goal, right? But when you are in that position room, and I know you said you're bouncing around, but like you, you form that bond with those guys. I don't know. It almost, beca- it, it becomes a, a bit of a sanctuary of sorts w- with your position group. Do you, do you miss that at all? Or do, do you feel yeah. like you're getting, getting it with every position group as you bounce around? No, I do. I do miss it. You know, when we go to position meetings before practice and things like that, you miss going into that room where it's just you and your guys. There's no question. And I can't remember if I told you guys last year when we did this, but like literally in my office at our facility on the wall, I've got a picture of myself and the tight ends. And after we beat Texas in 2020 on the field after the game. Um, and that's hanging on the wall in my office, you know, the last position group that I coached uh, before I became a head coach. And I certainly miss those relationships of being able to go in that position meeting room for one hour each day and not just talk football, but just life and, and, and whatnot. But as a head coach, because I'm not calling the offense, I'm not calling the defense, I'm not coaching the special teams. No, I'm involved in all three. I never want to be one of those guys that has no clue and, what we're doing scheme wise. I am, I mean, I'm in all the meetings. I know what we're doing in all three phases. I'm involved with all three phases. Um, but, uh, I'm a head coach. that doesn't call it on game days. So it allows me during the week to really have those relationships with each player on the team. And they know my office door is always open. So I love the fact that guys will just pop in my office each day and come in and talk and, and BS and, and whatever, you know, before meetings, after meetings, most of them have to walk right past my office to get to, you know, their position meeting room. So it's a chance to see guys that way. And then I'll, I'll bounce around and, and go, you know, to the different position meetings as well from time to time, not trying to like micromanage coaches, but just be involved and, walk into the offensive line room and hang out in there with those guys on a Tuesday or go to the defensive backs meeting or whatever it may be. So I still get a piece of it and, and, and miss the, the having your own group, but I look at it that I got uh, nine groups, you know, that I get to coach or be around right now. And, and it's, and it's different, but it's, it's, it's better in a lot of ways too. We'll get you right back to the interview, but first. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence. Just look at Mr. Eichard sitting right there, the shining example of Bishop McGinnis with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you are doing, head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey. It was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate. And you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcony's Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcony's Pot Still Bourbon. Its big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. In 2012, Balcony's Single Malt won the Best in Glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen, and became the first American distillery to win the competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcony's products are the only way to go. 
The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners, yeah, they're from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit balconiesdistilling.com. All right, back to the interview. Now, I know you uh, have a good relationship with Lincoln Riley and a lot of those coaches at Oklahoma. Were you, how'd you react whenever you saw that he was leaving for USC? I was shocked. Yeah. (laughs) Shocked. Probably like a lot of people were. Um, We had, uh, we, um, that was a, that was a Sunday, right? Yeah, it was a Sunday. And um, um, we, I didn't see, we were playing the same time that Oklahoma was playing Oklahoma State, I guess. I think our game ended against Clemson and I caught the last bit of that game on television, went to bed. We were getting ready to go recruiting that two days later on that Monday, we had a little team workout with our players on that Sunday. And it's kind of like one of those, you remember where you were type moment. And, and uh, I literally, I, I was standing on our practice field our players were lifting weights. We had a group out on the practice field just doing some running uh, uh, outside. And I was standing outside talking with one of those guys. And the head of our recruiting called me and he said, did you see who's taking the the uh, Southern Cal job? And I said, no, who? And he said, Lincoln Riley. And it was like, what? Because um, I surely did not see uh, that one coming. And you guys obviously were right in the middle of it. And you know, and I had talked to Lincoln, I guess I had talked to Lincoln on the phone for a long time, about three weeks earlier. Uh, and obviously that didn't come up. We were just kind of catching up on my season, their season. Um, and uh, and then I hadn't talked to him, you know, up until that point. So I was as surprised as anybody and certainly a, um, certainly a crazy time there. I, when, when it happened, I immediately reached out to you. <laughs> And did I, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, I know you're very happy as the head coach at South Carolina. Did you expect to get a call? Like when, when you saw that Oklahoma was open, like what I I know your initial reaction was, Oh my gosh, I can't believe Lincoln left. But for yourself, were you like, Hmm, I, I think it's only natural to be like, I hope they call me like just to, to have that feeling, even if you were going to stay at South Carolina, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. I knew I wasn't going anywhere because I, I, I love this place. And, uh-huh. and we're just getting okay. started. Um, you know, the Virginia tech situation had happened like two or three weeks earlier. And uh, you heard my name mentioned with Virginia tech and I had been very outspoken that I wasn't going anywhere. So I knew I wasn't going anywhere. And I don't know. I mean, I, 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 we loved our time at Oklahoma. I love Joe Castiglione and, and President Harris. They're awesome. Um, you know, I've kept, kept in touch with them. I'd get text messages, you know, periodically during the season from Joe C and, and think the world of him. But, you know, I also knew when you talk about Oklahoma, you're talking about one of the premier jobs in the world and that anybody who's anybody would have interest in that position and they could pick up the phone and call about anybody and they would have an interest in the position. So, you know, it was more just at that point, we had gotten hammered by our in-state rival the night before uh, I was going recruiting the next day. And, and it was, uh, that was really where my focus was, but, you know, uh, certainly loved our time there and, and there's great people there and there's a reason it's one of the premier programs, athletic programs in the country. And, and that's because of guys like you that came before and the leadership they have there now. And, and you guys had just played Clemson and Brent Venables was there. And uh, what's kind of been the, the chatter. And I don't know if you, you guys overhear much of it, but with him leaving and, and going to Oklahoma, what was the reaction around that, that area of the country? Um, at least in our football facility relief, <laughs> 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 he was gone. Um, he uh, now I know they promoted from within at Clemson and, and they've got great players and they still have great coaches. But, you know, what Coach Venables had been able to do on defense in his time at Clemson was remarkable. I mean, just year in, year out. And I've got so much respect. I really don't know him personally, but I've just got so much respect for the. Uh, what they did schematically at Clemson. I mean, and just what a challenge it was to prepare for. And, you know, Gabe and I were talking about it earlier, you know, when he was, before we started about when he was, you know, playing offensive line there at OU and 
going against them in practice and having to make calls and things like that. They're just, they're so multiple. And, you know, there's a lot of teams you play, you, you got an idea of what these guys are going to be and you know what they're going to be in and you can put together a plan to attack it. But with him, I mean, it's, an, it's impossible because they do so much. And you just don't know what uh, they're going to be doing because they're so multiple. So excited for him. I mean, that was a natural uh, fit after his time at Clemson and, you know, pretty cool that he could stay at Clemson and be patient and, and win a lot of football games there and then come back to a place that, you know, he had been before that, that, that he loved, obviously, you know, so um, I know for me personally, I'm glad we don't have to face him anymore. I know it'll still be a challenge facing Clemson, but I know he'll do a great job there in Norman. With, with the change at Clemson, right? They, they've been, they've had so much continuity, especially from a staff perspective with them losing Tony Elliott, Tony Elliott and losing Brent Venables is, do you guys at South Carolina, do you see it kind of as a window of opportunity on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly some transition, but, but you know, Dabo's still there and they've still got great players and, and certainly, you know, they've lost some continuity, you know, and, and from my standpoint, it's I don't think Clemson's going anywhere and it's up to us to just continue to close that gap and you know let's let's just let's make South Carolina better and continue to get great players in here and continue to elevate their program and get this back to where you know it's a rivalry it still is a rivalry but a rivalry where you know we're winning our share of games you know when I was here as an as an assistant coach I was part of a you know I was part of a uh we won our 2009 and 10 we beat them those are my last two years here and then 2011, 12, and 13, South Carolina beat them. So there was a five-year run where South Carolina beat Clemson. And then since then, it's, it's, it's flipped. And uh, it's up to us, you know, as a program here at Carolina to, to get it back to where we're winning our share as well. And, you know, I think, you know, Clemson's still Clemson. I don't see in recruiting where guys are any less interested in them because Brent Venables has left and Tony Elliott's, Elliott's left. You know, that program speaks for itself and, and we've got great respect for them. And now we've got to do a great job of, of uh, getting our program to where it needs to be also. Are you going to start talking shit like Coach Spurrier did? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think uh, – Come on. I don't think will ever be at that level. Uh, you guys uh, – he, he's the best. So I, I saw – I got it firsthand, you know, during my time with him. And, and you'll appreciate this. Uh, I was, he gave, I, I won an award myself and Josh Heupel were co-winners of the Steve Spurrier first year coach of the year award for all of college football um, <clears throat> for a coach that took over the program and had the best first year. <clears throat> so we had to go down to get, not had to, we got to go down to Gainesville a couple of weeks ago for the uh, awards program. And, you know, coach Spurrier presents me the award and it's like a reunion of Florida greats. I mean, it's D Danny Werfel's there, Chris Doring's there, Shane Matthews, Doug Johnson, Kevin Carter. I mean, it's all these great former players. And Coach Spurrier, like only he can, he gets up there to introduce Coach Heupel. And he's like, one of Coach Heupel's biggest wins this year was over the University of Missouri. They scored 62 points against Missouri that day. He's like, all you Tennessee Vol fans in here, does the number 62 ring a bell? He's like, yeah, that's the same number of points that the Florida Gators scored on you guys back in 1995 when I was the head coach at Florida. And then he talked about how he threw a six-touchdown pass that night to Chris Doring because Chris hadn't caught a touchdown pass yet. He brought Danny Werfel up to explain how Danny Werfel threw the corner out you know, to Chris Doran. This went on for five or 10 minutes. And then he's like, all right, back to Coach Heupel. And then he presents Josh the award and all that as well. So he still has it in him. And Josh got up there and he said, you know, all the Tennessee contingent, we were all taking bets of the over under on how long it was going to take you to make a, take a shot at, <laughs> at Tennessee. So no, Teddy, I won't be, I won't be doing any talking like Coach Spurrier. I don't think anybody can. And Dabo and I got a good relationship. I got enough, you know, issues in my own program to be uh, uh, talking about anybody else right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so 
you, I, I mean, it wasn't that long ago when you were at OU, right? And, and you have, you've been uh, part of SEC staffs before, but clearly with the eventual move to the SEC for Oklahoma, like how different is life? in the sec maybe maybe from just a coaching res- perspective recruiting perspective like what is with what you experienced at oklahoma like wh- what what has to happen for them to prepare for that move to the southeastern conference yeah i think um you know i think coach venables coming in and you guys know better than i do i think coach venables coming in will do, he, he'll do a great job of of knowing what it takes and you know they weren't in the sec obviously at clemson but they're right in the heart of it and they're competing against sec teams they're they're you know an hour and 45 minutes from us they're an hour and a half from athens georgia you know i mean so they're right in the middle of the sec so he'll have a great idea of what things they need to do and i think the thing for me because i was i was in the sec then acc then big 12 i said the sec ACC back to the SEC, Big 12 back to the SEC. So I've kind of gone full circle in a lot of ways. And, you know, to me, the biggest difference on the field, in my opinion, is just the the overall depth and athleticism of the defensive linemen you see week in, week out. Um, and this is no disrespect to anybody in the Big 12. But, you know, in this league, I mean, every single week, there's, you know, you're playing defensive linemen that are, it's just like there's just so much depth and there's size and there's athleticism and there's how are we going to block this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Like we need to have a good plan for those guys. And that's every week. And I, you couldn't always say that in the Big 12 that you were going to face somebody every week where you better have a plan. Whereas the head coach, I can go into the offensive staff and say, hey, when we come back in here next Sunday after this game, number 97 better not have wrecked our game plan like we need to have a plan for this guy and that's every week and you couldn't always say that um in the big 12 and again that's not saying there's not great defensive linemen because there are there's just you look at the sec you look at the nfl draft i mean if you look at the nfl combine last week i'll uh, say it, Shane, coming. there's there's not a lot of great defensive linemen in the big 12 i'll be right. you can't so say there it, but you I'll go say it. There, there, yeah, i don't know the last time here. we saw a uh Six six three hundred and fifty pound defensive lineman run four seven. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's board. unbelievable, and it's every week. It's not just I mean it's every it's not just Georgia and Texas A and M and Alabama. I mean it's everybody you play, us included. I mean we've got uh, we've got draft picks on the defensive line, so I think that's on the field. And then the thing that I love about the SEC and um, you guys will and anybody that comes into it, it's just the the passion on a Saturday afternoon and, and every single stadium you go into that everywhere you go, it is the show in town. There's going to be, you know, anywhere from a hundred thousand plus, to, you know, 70,000 plus every single Saturday. And, you know, if you go, um, you don't always have that in, Oakland, in, in the big 12, you know, you didn't always go into a stadium on a, Saturday morning for an 11 a.m. kickoff and just feel the, the the intensity when you roll in on the buses and you do in this league every single week, which I love, you know, about this conference and and um and, and what makes it special. Did I, I'm I'm wondering your reaction to what the Georgia defensive lineman did at the combine because <laughs> probably your most now you had a hell of a season, great year one. But I think maybe the most memorable moment from you is is after that Georgia loss when you were talking about how many five stars they had and finished it with one of my all time favorite. Damn, <laughs> like it <laughs> when, when you saw those guys from Georgia in that clip because the clip kept get it came back up right. it, yep. it resurfaced. Um, were you happy or mad about that? Because you're like, man, I thought that that was. I thought I had, uh, my my reaction was like, see. Like, I told y'all, like, I wasn't lying uh, when I got when I got asked that question. But no, I mean, and and that clip was was literally ten minutes after the game, and you're still like uh, on an emotional high from the game. And then the reporter, who's awesome, I got a great relationship with him, but he was asking me about you know what were they doing defensively? Were they doing anything with their front and coverages and pressures? And I'm like. No, there. Uh, and then the clip 
took off. Um, but they're immensely talented. They're also really well coached. But I saw firsthand when I think on the very first play of the game, we ran a little zone read and the quarterback pulled it. And when he pulled it, I'm sitting there saying, oh, man, it's going to be like a six, seven yard game because we had them. And it ended up being, I think, a one yard game. And it was second and nine. I mean, they just closed so fast and they're so talented. Um, so it definitely, not that I needed any validation, but I wasn't lying when I said they've got a 300 whatever plus pound defensive lineman that runs better than anyone on this call. Uh, I was telling the truth. And after that, my athletic director was kind of like, maybe after these games, maybe just take like a little bit of a longer cooling off period before you before you go in there to post game press conferences. <laughs> I, I would love to know, like the few people that were offended by that, like, no, there's no way Jordan Davis is faster than me. No chance. <laughs> but OK, last one, Shannon, we always we always love having you on, man. This is probably the most important question for for any football coach at South Carolina. Have you become best friends with Darius Rucker yet? Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes. He um I feel like that's the mark of making it as the South Carolina football coach. Yeah, no, I think so. I think once you're in there with him, you're good. And he's he's awesome. Um, um I was actually with him last uh last Monday. Um there's a women's golf tournament down in Hilton Head that has his name on it. It's a Darius Rucker Invitational. So I was down there and a part of that event with him. And he's uh, uh, the thing that's awesome about Darius is Darius is like so like low key. When he comes to a football game or a basketball game, you, you wouldn't even know it. You know, he, he and I, our women's basketball team played Stanford earlier in the season. And he and I sat together and he was just there at the game with his son and and, and tried to just, you know, stay in the background and same thing when he comes to football games. And he's been a great friend of our program. He's very supportive. I'll get text messages from him after games and he's, uh, he's awesome. So um, fortunate to be here at Carolina with him. This is his school and, and I'm honored to be the, the football coach here as well. So we, um, 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 we got to get you guys out there and, and get around him. So I'm still working on Zach Selman out there at Oklahoma. I know Zach's a big Darius fan as well. So anytime I'm around Darius, I'll make sure I, uh, I let Zach know it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, congrats on a successful year one. Uh, we're all fired up for you. See what year two has offered. And you have a couple more years to enjoy being kind of like Oklahoma's SEC team. Right, because we're all cheering for you. We want yeah. you to succeed. So enjoy that while it lasts, man. Yeah, exactly. Because after that, there's it's, there's no holds barred. It's on at, yeah. uh, at that point. So, no, absolutely. Thank you all. And you guys are the best. And love following you and watching you and appreciate your friendship and, and look forward to seeing you in South Carolina soon, too. Awesome, man. You're the best. Thank you, guys. He's still the best, man. Like, I... I know OU's going to be in the SEC eventually, and then I'm going to have to start hating him and South Carolina. But until that day, I'm, I root for South Carolina. I got no problem saying it. Now, I'm, I'm not, like, locked in on him, but he's just – he's too damn awesome to not cheer for. I love that man. I love that man. Yep, he's, he is great. And that's why I continue to think that, that he's going to have a lot of success there. Um, and however you measure that at South Carolina, I'm not exactly sure, but – a good first season, a good good uh, jump start on this thing, and made some good moves in recruiting in the transfer portal. So it, it's looking up for sure. Yeah, he's got that fan base fired up too, and it's he's he's off to a good start. Now we'll see if he can he can take that program to another level and, and make them an SEC contender. All right, just a reminder: no episode the rest of the week. We're taking that we're taking that day off. We will have a new episode that will drop Sunday night slash Monday morning. Bad turnip seed. Yes. The one, the only. Uh, just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can't hear me this week. I'm taking – my wife was like, you are taking the whole week off from radio. And nice. I was like, yes, ma'am. You're right. I am. <laughs> so hope you all have a great rest of your week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.